Thank you everyone for being here today. Really excited to have everyone here uh, to uh, see this today's amazing webinar on the why behind the buy. Um, it's an enlightening discussion uh, and session designed to transform our understanding of consumer behavior and decision making. And as everyone knows, in today's competitive marketplace, the ability to distinguish our brands by understanding consumer motivations is not just advantageous, it's essential. So we're exceptionally fortunate to have two distinguished experts from Cast and Hugh, Steve, Co Steve Koch and Jonathan Pattis. Uh, Steve has extensive experience in marketing and advertising and has been pivotal in crafting strategies that resonate deeply with consumers. And Jonathan is known for his innovative approach in two brand experiences, and he blends creativity and analytical thinking to uncover what truly drives consumer decisions. And today they will be sharing their insights to why choose, customers choose specific products and services to fulfill their needs and how to apply this knowledge to propel our brands in new heights. And so I thank you again for, for joining us. Uh, I really encourage everyone to be engaged, to participate, to ask questions and share insights in the chat. Um, looking forward to going through this uh, enlightening journey together. So Steve, Jonathan, I'll let you guys take it from here. So yes, today, uh, excited to chat with you all a little bit about the why behind the buy, um, really thinking about consumer motivations. And, we're, and a big part of what we're going to talk about is a, is a theory called jobs to be done um, that we believe is, is very strong in terms of un uncovering those motivations that people use to make decisions, which is important no matter what we're doing, whether it's marketing or Surrey is just talking to me about things. Um, at any rate, uh, so to start out, I want to think about, you know, we, we all like to think when we're buying things, when we're making those decisions, I think a lot of us think we make really logical, rational decisions, right? Like we're, we're pretty good about that, I would think. But then when you really think about it, like what if you're in the car market, right? And there's this Toyota Camry. That's a pretty logical decision. It's got great gas mileage. It's got everything I need. Um, it's, you know, it, it really is the total package. But then on the other hand, like, would it hurt if I took a look at the BMW? I mean, I could picture myself driving that thing down the highway, like on an on a April day here in Arizona. Um, boy, I'd feel pretty good driving that up to the valet stand. And, you know, they probably park it up front. It's pretty cool convertible. So I don't know. There, there, there's possibilities there. Or even let's fast forward like three hours from now, right? Like a lot of you might be eating lunch right now, but I get hungry around, you know, three o'clock or so. And you say, well, an apple, that's a good choice. So, you know, after all, it keeps the doctor away, right? It's a good deal. But on the other hand, like Snickers, I mean, it's it's pretty tasty. Um, maybe that's just something I should go for. Uh, or even, you know, Suri was just talking to me. We all have the iPhone in our pocket, right? Or or an Android or whatever it might be. But like, let's say you have the iPhone 12 and it does everything you need. Uh, it takes care. It takes care of everything in terms of like getting the job done, takes the photo, sends the text, lets you surf the net. Like you don't really, you're not wanting for much more. But I don't know. The iPhone 15 just came out. Um, that's titanium, no longer steel. I mean, that makes a difference, I think. Um, and that's dynamic island. I actually don't know what that is, but it's probably something that should have. You know, we have all these thoughts go through our head. So when you think about it and you look at all of these things together, whether it's the car, um, the candy bar, or the iPhone, it's like, how often do we make those those emotional decisions, you know? Um, and, and we rationalize them for ourselves. We say, boy, well, you know, with the, the BMW, it's, it's, it's the engineering and the resale value. That's going to be great. Or the stickers bar, you know, it's only like 260 calories. Like that's barely 20 more calories than a cliff bar and, and, and just a handful more than an apple. It's probably fine. Or the iPhone, you know, it's like, well, I the longer battery life, uh, pro motion technology. That's something I probably need to have. I need to stay ahead of the curve. You know, we all make those decisions and we all, you know, it's probably surprising to all of us how often we rationalize it. But there is a science behind that. And it really ties into our motivations. And that's really what we're gonna to cover today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about emotions because emotions is a core element of what motivates people to make decisions. And we're gonna talk about why that is and how we uncover those. And we do that, as I mentioned earlier, through jobs to be done theory and research. So we'll share a bit about that. We wanna leverage how you can use jobs to be done in your role. Um, we'll give you some examples of, of this and then give you some takeaways and uh, as, as we talked about, answer any questions you have. Um, but really quick about us, who's Cast and Hugh? Uh, we're a human-centered design collective, and 
And we like to say that we empower brands to differentiate in competitive markets. And we do that by uncovering the decision-making moments of customer and employee journeys that fuel the design of impactful experiences. Um, jobs to be done is, is one of the tools in our toolbox, but that's enough about us. I wanna talk more about emotions and, and a good way to start that is this quote coming up here. And you may have seen this before from Maya Angelou. Um, I've, learned what, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I think that's important to us in all of our roles, especially in marketing, uh, but really in anything we do. And it really ties into, you know, how emotions play a role in how we make decisions and how consumers make decisions. And there is, as we talked about earlier, there is science behind that. I want to share a little story along those lines. And, and this gentleman's name is Antonio Damasio. He's a, a neuroscientist and, uh, he famously, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, had a patient named Elliot. And Elliot uh, came to him because Elliot was a very successful businessman, father, great guy, but he, he had a tumor uh, in his frontal lobe. And he got that tumor removed. And after he had that tumor removed, he just he found that his, his life was just in shambles. So he went to Dr. Damasio and he said, you know... I just can't figure out what's going right, but I'm I'm just having a, a terrible time. And what Dr. Damasio found was interesting is, is, is Elliot was totally normal for the most part. He still had a 90, he was still in the 97% of IQ. He could do all sorts of things, but he did not show any emotions and he could not make a decision to save his life. He could not think about even things like, well, what color pin do I use to fill out a form at the office? Or what should I do for lunch later today? Or should I have chicken or turkey for dinner? He couldn't even make any of those decisions. And the it, and what Dr. Demacia, what this caused him to do was to really take a look at that and try to understand this connection between emotions and decision-making. And so what he did is he started studying folks who had the same type of brain injury uh, that Elliot and found that these people led totally normal lives, uh, but they had two things going on. They had, they showed no emotion at all and they could not make decisions and they could logically talk through, like if we're looking at this right now, they could say, well, you know, turkey has gravy on it and stuffing. Um, but then on the other hand, the carrots with the chicken, and they could go through that back and forth. They both have mashed potatoes. They could talk about it logically, but they couldn't pick one or the other. And so he dug into that and he found that there is a reason why behind that. And, and it comes down to two sides of our brain. And so when you think about it, we oftentimes you hear right brain, left brain, things like that. And, and, and certainly that's true, but we should also be thinking about the limbic system versus the neocortex. And so the neocortex is like the newest side of our brain. And it's, go ahead and click Jonathan. Um, and you know that's where all of our analytical thought and language is. And so that's where how we talk, how we communicate, it all comes to the neocortex. But our limbic systems is where the emotions are in our brain. And the key thing here is that our limbic systems process information 200 times faster than the neocortex. So they're making decisions for us before we can even verbalize them. And that's why we often find ourselves rationalizing and justifying these emotional decisions and why the emotional part of our brain plays such a role. And so the important thing to take away from this from a marketing perspective, from an experience design perspective, is that we often get so focused on rational elements of a purchase decision, of, a, of any decision, that we need to make sure we're never ignoring the emotional elements, because at the end of the day, those are often going to play the largest role in how consumers make decisions. And I want to dig into that a little further. What and, and kind of give you some ideas of like what to look for from a really high level, and then we'll dig into jobs to be done. Um, so the importance of emotion engaging with consumers, and, and it wouldn't be a, a presentation without at least a few stats to take home. I think, I think we all like that, right? So a couple of things I want to share. Um, number one, Forrester studied this and they found that emotion is the leading indicator of customer loyalty in 94% of the industries they studied. So almost every industry 
emotion, the emotional experience of people is going to indicate whether or not they're loyal. And then Disney did a study, probably not unsurprising. I could do a whole, a whole presentation on, on how Disney incorporates emotion into their experience, but that'll be another day. But, but they found in their study that if you optimize emotional connections, um, those companies outperform their competitors, uh, that create by creating consumers that are three times more likely to recommend and repurchase, which we all know is the holy grail. That's what we want people to do. We want those recommendations. We want people coming back and buying again. And then finally, and I think this is the one of the most impactful from the Harvard Business Review, lifetime value, which we all know is, is probably one of the most important metrics to study. Um, on a lifetime value basis, emotionally connected consumers are twice as valuable as highly satisfied customers. And so I think, you know, the thing I like to share about, to think about there is that the, the emotionally connected customers are twice as valuable as highly satisfied. Usually we're just aiming for highly satisfied and we think we've nailed it. Well, if we can create those emotional connections, our customers uh, could be twice as valuable. So uh, just a few things from a really high level, you know, that if you take anything away from today, some emotions to consider, whether it's in your marketing, in your experience design, as you're thinking about how you serve your customers, your employees, um, et cetera. But some of the most important emotions that, that come up through research on the on your left there are the positive emotions. So you're looking to build trust, right? Confidence, pride, relief. Those are all emotions that drive a lot of success. Whereas the emotions that could really be challenging for your for your company or organization or marketing are frustration, disappointment, confusion, anxiety. And so those are just from a big picture. If we're looking for those from a positive and negative side, we're going to find ways to be more successful. But if we dig a little deeper, we could think about emotions from the, the length of time that, uh, that they spend with people. Um, so this is a study that identified, you know, the, the emotions that last the shortest amount of time and those that last the longest. And I won't go through all of these. And, and as Taylor mentioned, you'll have the deck after this. So you can kind of look at these, but you can see some emotions, they're very short term. And, and this goes from, from, again, from left to right, shortest to longest. So like things like disgust and shame, um, anger, boredom, uh, surprise, those are short term emotions. They don't last as long. Sadness, on the other hand, hatred, joy, as upon the positive side, those last the longest. Sadness actually is the longest lasting emotion. That'll last upwards of 10 days. Um, where meanwhile, when we look at the, on the left side there, we're looking at emotions that last a matter of hours. So these are other things to look at when you're when you're identifying the emotions that you're either trying to communicate or the emotions that that your customers are experiencing at this time. This kind of helps you figure out where you want to focus your your energies because you want to focus on on the positive long lasting emotions and turning around those negative long lasting emotions. And then finally, there was a study um, recently around the the science of customer emotions, and they identified the study authors identified ten high impact emotional motivators. And what they found is that these are from a business perspective or an organizational perspective, these are the emotional motivators that are going that are are important to changing consumer behavior. And I'll go through these quickly because again, you'll have this. But but you know well, how we like to think about these emotional motivators is that you know when we can identify in this first one this desire to stand up from the crowd. Well, if 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 your consumer has that desire, then your action could be help them identify or help them project a unique social identity, help them be seen as special. And and but the way to go over this, and actually go ahead and click through these, Jonathan. But there's 10 of these. And and the way to think about these are if you could identify what of these desires are most important to the consumers you serve, then you could focus on those, focus on delivering an experience, focus on delivering communication that really work towards fulfilling these desires. And so this we wanted to leave with you as, a, as a, something to look at, to think about, you know, what we do is we look at our clients, consumers and, and talk to them and, and research them. And we understand what are the desires that are most relevant um, to, to our clients or can, to our clients needs so that we could start to designing experiences, designing messaging that really fit these. So now we wanna, dig into uh, jobs to be done and, and how we use jobs to be done to understand consumer decision-making. And um, I'm gonna start out 
with a little bit of a story uh, uh, about Snickers. And uh, we talked about Snickers earlier. It's definitely can be an emotional purchase, but um, it's actually related to jobs to be done even more. And so, you know, back about 20, 25 years ago, um, you know, you may know that Snickers is owned by M&M Mars and they also own Milky Way. And so you could probably picture a meeting in a boardroom talking about efficiencies, right? We've all probably been in those meetings once or twice. And, and so there, you could see an executive team looking at this, say, you know, we have Snickers and we have Milky Way. And they're pretty much the same candy bar, except Snickers has nuts. So at the same time, we've got separate, you know, operations. We've got separate production facilities. We've got separate marketing and brand budgets. We're spending all of this money on two products that are basically the same. So they said, you know what? Snickers, Milky Way, you've got a few months. Come back to us and make your case why we shouldn't spin you off, sell you, or just shut you down. So the Snickers folks went out and, and they they hired a, a gentleman named Bob Mesta. Can you go back one, Jonathan? And, uh, and they talked to Bob about um, this new thing that, that he was working on called Jobs to be Done. And jobs to be done, this idea of understanding how people make decisions. And so Bob used jobs to be done, and he went out and talked to people as they made purchases. So he was at airports, he was at grocery stores, he was at Circle K's, and he'd see somebody buy a Snickers, and he'd say, hey, I grab you know, 20 minutes of your time, I want to talk, talk to you about this. And he would dig into people around their purchase decision. So, you know, if I asked you, and you may know the answer to this already because it just flashed up, or you may have an idea, but... If I asked you, you know, what uh, the main competitors of Snickers are, what would you say? I'll see if there's any fast typers, but this is what you might say, right? Like there's, you know, things like Hershey's, uh, you know, Baby Ruth, uh, Kit Kat, Nestle Crunch, right? And that's, that's really the world that, yeah, Taylor was thinking Baby Ruth. I was too. It's very similar. I, I make it a tough choice. And Evelyn likes Mars bars. I like it. Um, so yeah, that, and that's the world that stickers was playing in. They're looking at that candy aisle at the circle K and they're saying, those are our competitors. But what the jobs we done research uncovered is that it was a totally different set of competitors. It was things like a handful of nuts. It was a bag of chips. It was a cliff bar, kind bar, fruit, even the apples that we talked about earlier. And, and the reason for that is that the P the reason people were buying stickers, they found out was not necessarily to, to get something, you know, good tasting to eat. They were at that point, you know, between like two and three o'clock where they were like hungry. And they were saying, you know what? I need something to get me through to dinner and stickers is easy. And so their job to be done was that when I'm hungry, I need something to satiate my hunger to help me make it through the day. And that was the reason people made those decisions. Where meanwhile, they found out the reason why people buy Milky Way is a totally different reason. It's like when I deserve it, I hire Milky Way as a sweet treat. And so they talk, they think about like the fact that Milky Way is something that like I deserve, whether it's a good day, a bad day, whatever it might be, the Milky Way is great. And so when you think about it, that really impacted how they went to market. And so you think about the marketing campaigns that we see every day for Snickers, because they have not changed this campaign in 20 years. You act like a diva when you're hungry, hungry, grab a Snickers. And, you know, it, and you're not yourself when you're hungry. Thank you, Taylor. And and yeah, exactly. Like the Betty White commercials that are classics. The thing to think about is they never talk about taste. They never say, oh, it's a it's a crunchy, nutty, caramelly treat. It's about hunger. And that change in position propelled them. So not only did m and Mars end up keeping both brands, but they ended up, um, stickers ended up becoming the number one selling candy bar in the world after that marketing change. And so meanwhile, Milky Way though, it's like, oh, I missed my wedding because I'm treating myself to a Milky Way. They went in a totally different direction, even though these are two of the same candy bars. So that gives you kind of a high level idea of how we think about jobs to be done. We're gonna dig into it a little bit more so you get an understanding of that. Um, but one thing we think about is we, you know, the sticker story really, really shows that jobs to be done is this theory of consumerism. And it, it demonstrates that in three ways. You know, what causes people to choose our products and services? So they found, you know, that's this hunger that drives people to choose Snickers. Uh, who who do we compete against? It's not always exactly who you think it is. And that's, we're going to talk about that more in a moment. And then finally, how do we help 
consumers make positive change. And that's a big part of jobs to be done because the core of jobs to be done is really about making progress and positive change is often part of that progress. And, and that's why it's often called a theory of progress. And I'm gonna pass it over to Jonathan to, to talk more about that and, and share a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of jobs to be done. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so yeah, so if we, if we think about jobs to be done as this theory of progress, um, let's talk about what progress is first, and then I'll talk about some of the, the details that, that ladder up to that. So um, think about it this way, right? So jobs to be done says that your customer or the person who's hiring your product or service, yeah, your customer is hiring your product, right? Or service in order to make progress in their lives, right? So you're, you're not selling a uh, fire flower, you're selling becoming fire Mario, right? You're this ability to shoot fireballs. This is the job that your customer wants to get done. So instead of marketing your product, you're marketing this idea of who your customer is gonna become because they're buying your product. So there's a few building blocks that go into that, right? So there's, there's kind of three ways that we'll approach this and I'll go into detail on each of these. There's understanding, uh, decision-making through emotional and social drivers, not just functional needs. Um, and Steve already talked a little bit about emotions and, and social drivers so far. Um, but then there's also understanding why consumers make that choice to switch from run one product or, or service to another. And that's called the four forces of progress. And what we found is Right now, consumers are incredibly fickle, or not fickle, but you know they know what they want and they're switching brands more often than they ever have in the past. Um, we all do this as well. Brand loyalty is, is kind of going down. Um, so understanding why people are switching between one product or service to another is really key in, in marketing. And then finally, it's, it's about defining market opportunity, right? Understanding demand and defining market opportunity through identifying the direct and indirect competitors. So um, let me dive into to each of these. So needs, we talked a little bit about emotions, but let's talk about how needs help us understand progress, right? People have a lot of choices right now. And so it's really helpful for us to break down their needs into these different groups, right? So we think about functional needs. What are the rational features and benefits that a person needs from a product or service? This is something really straightforward. Um, it's functional. It's really easy for you to um, understand like what, what this is. But then if you go a level deeper, you get into these emotional and social needs. So the emotional needs are these positive or negative thoughts and emotions that are driving someone's decision. Steve already talked about the importance of emotions on decisions. So we like to classify what are the emotional needs that people have um, how does using that product or service make them feel? And then finally, there's social needs. How will other people perceive, respect, or trust me, um, acknowledge someone when they purchase a product or service? You know, this is a lot about that. Maybe somebody might be buying a BMW because of how others will perceive them when they are driving that BMW, right? So this, these social needs also play a role in understanding the progress that someone is trying to make. I'll give you an example of choosing a dentist. Uh, this is a fun one. Um, okay, so let's think about the functional needs of choosing a dentist. We have technology. I need to make sure that this technology, the technology is sound. There's a, they have a good range of services. They have everything that I need. They're not just you know giving me a cleaning. They also have the X-rays and stuff like that. And they're also you know maybe doing some cosmetic work. Um, my insurance covers it. Uh, it's convenient. It's nearby my house. Then when it comes to emotional needs, these ones are pretty important. And, you know, you got this fear management. People are afraid to go to the dentist. Trust and confidence. You want to, you want to trust your, your dentist that they're, they're um, I mean, they're putting power tools in your mouth. And then you want to feel comfortable as well, right? You want to feel comfortable with this dentist. And then finally, um, the social needs, right? It's, it's, this is also, am I going to a, a, a dentist who has a good reputation, right? Um, are they engaged in the community? Maybe these are some of the needs that we have. We want to make sure that socially they're part of this, uh, this community that we're a part of, right? So that's a little bit about emotional needs. Now I'm going to talk, or, or sorry, functional needs, emotional needs, and social needs. 
Now I'm gonna talk about why consumers switch and this four forces of progress, right? So as I mentioned earlier, everybody has a lot of options these days. There's a lot of choices um, and I feel like our choices just keep increasing. So understanding these choices or why somebody chooses one product over another is really key. So let's think about it this way. We'll think about it kind of like um, these magnets, the, the you know, the push and pull, but then we have this existing situation and we have this new solution that, that people are looking at. So the things that are pushing people toward a new solution, that's the push of the current situation that you have. And it's also this pull of the new solution. But then that's not, it's, it's not that simple because there's also anxiety of going to a new solution or buying a new product or service. Um, and then there's these habits of the present, right? We're creatures of habit. So we like to do things that are familiar to us. I'll give you an example. Um, and this is, this is inspired by Steve who recently switched from Comcast to Hulu after giving this you know, example for years, he finally made the switch. I think that was like last month, so it's exciting. So, okay, the, the we'll think about Comcast, right? The push of the situation, poor customer service, we all know this. And the pull of the new solution of, of Hulu, this is simplified tech, right? Everything is integrated. But then there's also making that switch, there's things like, is the quality of the streaming gonna be as good when I move to Hulu, right? And am I gonna be able to get sports instantly and see them the same way that I get with my cable right now. But then there's also this DVR is programmed, right? You might have these shows that you're like, okay, I already have all these shows that are recorded. They know exactly when they're going to come up. So that's kind of a habit of the present that's blocking making that switch. So thinking about all the different forces, there's going to be, you can categorize them in four different ways. What are the things that help promote that new choice? And what are the things that are, are preventing that from happening? And I'll just add, um, you know, when you think about it, sorry, Jonathan, but when you think about it from a marketing perspective, we could look at this and say, if I'm the marketer at Hulu and I understand, you know, what's promoting that new choice and what those forces are that are blocking it, I can make sure that I'm designing my experiences and my marketing to better fit that. Meanwhile, if I'm Comcast, um, which if I'm the person buying, you don't want to be Comcast, but if I'm Comcast, I could start understanding, okay, here's why people are switching. So how can I, you know, design communication to, to help, you know, stop that? How can I design experiences um, that better fit that? And we see that at times, but this is why, this is how the four forces can be really impactful for market. Thanks, Steve. So, um, yeah, and then this third pillar is understanding competition, right? So we'll use the example of LA Fitness. Um, and LA Fitness has a lot of competitors out there. There's a lot of direct co competitors that have the word fitness in their name, right? 24-hour fitness, anytime fitness, planet fitness. Um, so if you're at LA Fitness and you're focused on marketing, you could say why you're better than 24-hour fitness or anytime fitness or planet fitness, and you could compete with them. But there's not much that's really differentiating you from these other services. Maybe your marketing, it sounds very similar to them, but what are the other competitors that LA fitness has that are indirect, right? So if we think back to these functional, emotional, and social needs, the social need is like, maybe you want to go to a gym like orange theory, where you're with a group of people and you're going through the exact same workout at the same time. And there's a little bit of camaraderie, right? We've all been there where you're, you're in the middle of it and it's really tough and you like give somebody a high five next to you or give them a thumbs up or whatever that is. So that's like meeting a social need that people want to feel connected as opposed to going to a gym where everybody's doing their own thing on a different machine. But then there's also this emotional need of saying like, oh, I work out because I'm stressed out during the day and I need to relieve that anxiety. And so maybe going for a hike is just as much of a competitor um, where you can say, well, I the reason I want to exercise is because I want to get out and I want to go and blow off some steam in nature. And then finally, there's this like functional need that's tied to like, hey, I only have 30 minutes for a workout. I can hop on a Peloton that's in my house, get that knocked out and get right back to work. So this kind of ties back to those functional, emotional and social needs that we have. But if you're that person who's marketing for LA Fitness, start speaking to those needs and figure out ways that LA Fitness can meet those other needs as opposed to just saying we're better than the other fitness um, stores out there. It's not stores, gyms. Um, 
Perfect. So when we think about understanding direct and ind indirect competition, you want to uncover that full spectrum of the market all and understand all the choices that are available to your audience. You also want to position and differentiate by how you help accomplish the job, not by just comparing yourself to direct competitors. And then finally, you want to innovate and improve using those insights gleaned from indirect competitors. So I'm using those indirect competitors, that should be how you're designing your marketing if you tie it back to that progress that somebody's trying to make. So um, really quickly, how to conduct some of this job is to be done research because you're all saying, okay, cool, but how do I do this? Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on the anatomy of a jobs to be done interview. It all starts with empathy, right? So you need to establish empathy. At Cast and Hugh, what we do is, is qualitative research. So we get really in depth and we do one-on-one -on -one interviews because we feel that's the best way to understand and establish em empathy, but then also understand this whole journey. So you wanna start um, at the beginning, you wanna start at the moment that they had that need and then you want to walk through their story, probe around needs, motivations, constraints, and enablers. And I'll talk about those are in just a second. And then obviously you want to understand what are the outcomes that people have, not like what are the features that they're using, what are the outcomes, and what is that desired state that somebody's trying to get to? Um, it's asking this question, what did that allow you to do, right? It's, it's pushing just a little bit past what they're doing and that, like what's that progress that they're able to make. So we break down insights on these, you know, kind of these five different, um, you know, uh, categories. We have context, constraints, enablers, desires, and progress, and those those make up this uh, this jobs to be done uh, group of insights. So concept, context is obviously understanding the background and the influences on the experience. Constraints are anything that are preventing somebody from making progress. They're holding them back. Friction points is another term for this. Then we have enablers, which is the opposite of that. What are the things that are helping people make progress? Desires, this is like understanding what's missing from the experience, what's needed, what are these short-term needs that might exist? And then progress is ultimately understanding that job that a person has to be done. So the difference between desires and progress is important here because they can seem very similar. Desires are when you're experiencing a product or service. It's like, it's like when you're using it, um, it's, it's important when you're actively engaging with the product and it starts and it stops. Whereas progress is something that's always ongoing. It's always important. And it's how a person is actually changing because of using that product or service, how they're changing as a person. So when we take these insights, we can, we can scale them um, to make them more functional and actually apply them, right? So it's going beyond demographics to segment audiences based on these motivations and behaviors. And we do that through what's called demand profiles, which is our form of personas. So how we look at demand or how we look at personas is we call them demand profiles because it's all about understanding demand, right? What are the trade-offs people are making for a product or service? And they're causation focused, right? So they're based on how people are making decisions as opposed to personas which a lot of times can be correlation focused. It's a representation based on key demographics and attitudes. So um, demand profiles are all based around how, why people are hiring the product or service. We usually don't give them, um, we don't make like traditional personas. It's more contextualized by the goal. So it's like always being prepared as opposed to saying, oh, this is Bob the planner and Bob the planner has this and that. Um, and then it identifies areas of growth, differentiation, and innovation based on those motivations. Whereas for personas are typically just like, it's a lot of grouping people through likes, dislikes, and demographics. So um, you can take a traditional persona and figure out ways to um, tweak it a little bit to get more focused on demand profiles, but it's better to almost start with those um, motivations, why people are making decisions, and then layer the rest of this on. That's how we do it. So here's some examples of demand profiles that we have. Um, you'll see that we have like a progress summary. We have the core needs here. Um, I'll share another example later, but this is great because we get into understanding causation, right? We, we understand how people make choices and decisions. We understand the progress the desires, the motivations, the pain points that are impacting behavior. And this also helps us if we move beyond just like 
marketing, this is, also can help with innovation, right? D developing products and services that are innovative, that are moving ahead of what currently exists because it's based on that progress that somebody's trying to make. And then finally, it's it's you can tailor your marketing, messaging, um, and experiences to to meet those needs and really focus on the um, you know to tie it back to the emotions piece. Like, how does your product or service or experience meet those emotional needs of someone so that it can be differentiated? So, um, I'm going to pass it back to Steve now uh, to talk a little bit about jobs to be done in the wild. So we'll share a quick little example of how this works. Yeah, I'll share a couple a couple case studies to kind of give you an idea of how we've used jobs to be done in the past, especially to to impact you know consumer marketing, messaging, and, and positioning. And so this first one is is for a clinic called Stridewell, uh, which is a same day spine clinic. Uh, that you know the the focus was actually that the the person who started this saw this hole in the market where if you have back pain. Um, you don't have a lot of choices if you need urgent care. You can go to the emergency room, you can go to your primary care, you could go to a traditional urgent care, but they don't have back specialists there, right? So they're, you know, they're basically going to stabilize you and then say, go see a back specialist when you can make an appointment. It could take weeks. So the idea was to create a same day spine clinic so people that have those needs could, could get that care quickly. And so we, we use jobs to be done to really understand how they could differentiate, how they could stand out, and how they could message to folks. So we did uh, a number of jobs to be done interviews with people who had sought care for back pain and worked to understand what some of those needs were. So these were some of the key findings that came out of the jobs to be done. You know, people seeking actual information to really help them move forward. And it's a really emotional need around moving forward, right? And, and similarly, that desire to get back to a normal life. Um, that was a big part of what people were looking for. They were frustrated with the time, kind of a functional need around the time it takes to get to a spine specialist. And they felt like they were never making progress, always in this never ending loop of spine pain. Um, and then a functional need around just like I'm at the traditional, you know, physician's offices or emergency room. There's no no place for me to sit to be comfortable. And I have back pain sometimes sitting on a normal chair just, just doesn't work for me. So we took that and and then um, you know using research developed uh, demand profiles and for, so from a high level demand profile um, we had these four areas and and kind of four focus areas and this first one was around you know that person that that's that has ongoing pain and wants to get back to the normal life uh, the second person was that athletic person is that that's a big area around people that are just like you know I pulled something or injured my back playing a sport or whatever it might be. So, you know, get me back to the gym. That's their number one goal. And then the third focus here was if I'm having like on like, like intensely an acute back pain, like, like I wake up and I didn't have pain last night and now all of a sudden I can't get out of bed. So these people that have the just a quickly acute onset back pain. And then the fourth focus was this area around their number one thing was, are you in my network? Will you take my insurance? Well, and in this case, uh, they they were a cash pay business and were not working with insurance uh, in order to keep costs low. And so that fourth focus was was not really a priority. So kind of give you the idea of how we think about that. And then you can really apply that from a, give you a high level example of how we applied that to messaging. And so you could see that these four, you know, these are the titles that we gave these four different demand profiles. Um, you know, we had messaging to them. So the people that we called out not moving like I used to, you know, get back to the real active you is the message. Or the person for looking for that life free of pain, that's a little bit more emotional. So your final solution for a normal pain-free life. Um, or the people with that onset acute issue, it's, it's kind of very emotional. Um, what is What in the world is happening to me? You know, prompt treatment when time is critical. And then we still, you know, we knew we didn't take insurance, but but we still wanted to talk to those folks. So those, the are you in my network group? We said, you know, skip the middleman between you and care, get right to it. Um, so it gives you an idea of how we could utilize that. And then another thing that, that we did here was what we call an experience blueprint. I won't go into too much detail on this because it gets into experience and marketing, but it's it's kind of a, you could think of it as a, as a future facing journey map. So it shows, 
you know, the entire experience from, uh, from scheduling an appointment to follow up and how we can make sure that we're providing, you know, experiences and communication that meet the emotional needs that we identified through all this research. And so that's really what this gets to both from a marketing standpoint, as well as what it's like in the clinic itself. So I'm going to pass it over to Jonathan to talk a little bit about another quick example. Great. Thanks, Steve. So um, we did some work with PF Chang's very similar to this. Um, and this was in, to give you a good context, this was in, I think we delivered insights in like February of 2020. Um, so PF Chang's at the time was struggling because a lot of, they, they saw that more people were moving to this, uh, these delivery services, right? These digital delivery platforms, which we all know took off after um, 2020, but they wanted to understand like, why were people coming into PF Chang's? How can we market to them? How can we inform a digital marketing strategy that's gonna understand the consumer motivations and behavior so that we can capture more of that market and speak to people and, and um, stay competitive with some of these uh, disruptors that were coming into the market, right? Because needs were evolving um, and this whole, this whole model was evolving. So what we did is we uh, did qualitative research. We spoke to their customers. We spoke with, um, I think it was a, a large, usually with these, we have a pretty large sampling, at least eight, uh, at least eight interviews with any specific segment. So I think this one was like, uh, we did 40, 40 or so um, interviews, but we came up with these, um, these core needs, supportive desires. And then on the left-hand side, you see all of these demand profiles. And so what's interesting here is um, we, we came to them and we were like, you know, one of the one of these top uh, demand profiles that, that has kind of come out of this research is that people were really um, concerned about safety. And that was one of the big reasons why people were eating a P.F. Chang's. And that's because P.F. Chang's cooks everything. is Everything is made to order. They're very uh, focused on dietary restrictions, but there's this consistency in how they prep the food every single time. And they're very conscious of allergies and gluten and all of that. So, um, and they were like, well, I don't know. I don't know so much about that. Some of these other demand profiles, it, it seemed like they resonated more. And what we did and what we were always planning on doing is how do we scale these insights to understand on a larger scale, how this, how this, you know, works and how we can add some demographic data for paid targeting because they were doing paid marketing in addition to this. So how can we target people with these demand profiles based on um, some of that other demographic information? So we actually put out a survey um, which helped us understand how people self-selected for each of these um, types of progress, right? Each of these demand profiles. And what it proved is that accommodation and food safety were actually um, top for both all three of these groups of folks that they were marketing to for dine-in, for takeout, and for delivery. Um, and you'll see there was a, a significant amount of them that self-selected into this. So what we do at this point is we have people self-select. We have a, a much larger sample and have people self-select into those demand profiles. And then we can add some of that more quantitative data on the back end. Um, to inform how we how we speak to them. So you'll see here's an example of this safety first demand profile, but you see that not only are we able to share that progress summary and kind of those emotional and functional and social needs, but we're also able to give that, that demographic information that helps from a paid media standpoint or however else you wanna to market toward them. So yeah, but uh, demand profiles always have, you know, core motivations and then um, ways that we can act on those motivations. So I know we're almost at time here, but I want to really quickly go through, um, you know, what to consider when doing this, this type of research and, and taking this on. So always start with needs um, as opposed to starting with demographics. And that's kind of coming back to what we were talking about with the personas. Um, let the feedback uh, from people define your focus as opposed to relying on assumptions. Let the research guide that. You want to define segments based on themes that emerge from the research as opposed to creating subjects or segments um, around your services or demographics or departments, whatever works for your business. Instead, focus on the people first. Um, 
have a, a systems thinking approach. So understand how this impacts your employees as well, as opposed to eliminating employees from the research. So we, a lot of times will include employees in our research, make sure to re recruit the right people and not just people who are giving you, you know, glowing reviews and all of your most loyal customers. You also want to speak to those people who are upset with you, right? Because those people are going to give you um, the most, uh, most crucial feedback. Um, and then finally, focus on that, that those emotional needs in marketing communication, as opposed to really getting into those functional needs, right? So this comes down to a lot of that, you know, feature benefit, uh, but going beyond that a level to saying like, what are these emotional needs? How can we talk to people based on their emotional needs? And then I'll let yeah, Steve talk and, a little bit about, yeah. Yeah. So it, if you want to learn a little bit more about jobs to be done, we, we included some resources and you can kind of get to some links about these in, uh, in the PDF that will be available. You know, the thing I'll note is that there's, a, believe it or not, there's a lot of different schools of thought on jobs to be done. And, you know, Clayton Christensen was really the person who, who uh, really promoted jobs to be done. He was at Harvard. He's this Christensen Institute focuses on jobs to be done. And even though Clayton Christensen passed away a few years ago, it still is, is doing some amazing work in the space. Um, Tony Olwick does a lot of work in the space, also kind of considered one of the founders very focused on innovation. And that's something, you know, jobs to be done almost started as an innovation tool. And I think uh, Maria mentioned that earlier in the chat that she uses jobs to be done in innovation in her role. Um, but as you've seen, it also plays a big role and we can understand those needs and not only impacts innovation, we can innovate based on unmet needs, but it also impacts marketing and communication that, because we understand how people make decisions. So. Um, Alan Clement is is someone that 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 we like quite a bit, but I talk to people who don't like him. So it's it's a it's a funny space. And then this book by Jim Polbeck came out a couple of years ago. Um, it's really a, I think Jim has the biggest kind of broadest view of jobs to be done, and actually gets into a lot of application in this book as well. So a couple of things for you to check out if if this is interesting to you. But yeah, I want to say thank you everybody for your time. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about this topic that we love. Um, and yeah, definitely welcome any questions or discussion or thoughts. Excellent. Well, thank you both so very much. This was a lot of great information. So right now is the Q&A time. So feel free to post any questions that you might have or raise your hand if you want to be unmuted. Uh, in the meantime, you know, you mentioned how you are, are talking to customers, both happy and unhappy. Are, are you doing intimate, you know, one-to-one -one meetings in person? Are they on the phone? Are they via Zoom? And on average, how long are these interviews? Good question. Um, the nice thing is these days they're, they're primarily virtual and they're impactful virtual because we're really having a discussion and we can do them by phone as well. And so the nice thing is that that people are, since 2020, much more uh, open to video interviews and things of that nature. So that, that helps with efficiency. I would say the interviews on average are about an hour, usually 45 minutes to an hour. So um, as, as Jonathan noted a few minutes ago, recruiting Recruiting is super important. It's probably one of the most challenging parts of our of our job because uh, you know you're incentivizing people, and so that costs money. You're finding the right people, the right partners uh, to to help you recruit those people. Sometimes we can recruit them directly through our clients, uh, but other times we'll go out through third party, you know, marketing research recruiters to find the right people. But having that criteria, ensuring we're getting a good mix of of you know screening people who are you know, super fans, but also people that maybe, you know, it's always super valuable to talk to people who have switched or considered our client and then went someplace else or were a customer and went someplace else. So we kind of look for that, that broad mix of folks. And to continue in that question, like how big of a pool, you know, how, how yeah. do you base it on, you know, percentage of, of active patrons that you have or active clients you have, you know, how, how big of a pool do you uh, seek out before you're satisfied with your findings? So, uh, yeah, I, I think the um, the pool, we, we use this concept of, of theoretical saturation, and we actually find that we get about 80 to 90 percent of the insights from, you know, about eight of the eight interviews with any sp particular segment. So let's say you've got these, you know, four big segments, we'd say, yeah, probably doing, um, you know, anywhere between eight. I guess you could you could go like as low as six, but like six to ten interviews with each of those segments. Um, but it's not as necessary to um, 
do it based on total population of, of customers. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, does anyone else have a question at this point? You know, feel free to, um, oh, you, well, you did such a phenomenal presentation that Trevor had questions that you already answered, and that's what you really want to see in a presentation. Mm -hmm. So that is excellent. Are there any additional questions that you want additional clarification on or questions that maybe weren't answered from the presentation? Uh, we have a fairly small group right now, so feel free just to unmute yourself and ask the question. <clears throat> Sure, I, I can uh, ask a question. I, I was really interested to see the traditional personas and how you transition to the the uh, demand profiles. How, how difficult was it to transition that and to kind of communicate that to your clients who might be used to seeing those personas and, and looking at it a different way? Yeah, it's, you know, that's that's a good question. And, and I, I'd say that it's, there, there's definitely some some trepidation sometimes, uh, but uh, it, it's about education and really seeing that difference in terms of like, you know, the, the idea that so many, it, it, this isn't always the case because there's definitely personas out there that have elements of what we talked about in demand profiles, but, but a lot of personas we see, right, are like very geographic or um, generationally based, like here's what all millennials are going to do. And I think when you start thinking about how and show those examples and even just thinking about all of our regular lives, like how some things we do that are very much in line with maybe people in our area or our age or our gender or what have you, there's some things, but for the most part, we're all very different. And so segmenting, you know, segmenting by like age and generation um, was, was very much a media buying tool, right? Like, that's how we all bought media 25 years ago um, or maybe even 15 years ago. But now we, we're targeting is so nuanced. Um, we could get out there, especially from a digital perspective and target people by their habits, by their motivations. And so I think that's something that's opened it up as well. Like when, when people are saying, oh, I have to do a TV buy, um, that makes it a little more challenging because that's how you buy TV. But, but marketing, we all know, is so much more one-to-one -one now, so much more... Uh, so much more focused that demand profiles start to make a lot more sense. So we're seeing more people say, hey, let's let's really look at this perspective because that's going to help us really message better. Excellent. Thank you for that, Steve. And thank you for the question, Ryan. Do we have any additional questions? Going once, <laughs> going twice. Oh, look, you had just such a fabulous presentation with so many insights. That's why everyone is just inspired to look at their marketing messaging and seeing, are they touching on the emotion? Or are they just touching on the function? So you did a phenomenal job. So thank you so very much for that. Awesome. Thank you, Taylor. And thanks everybody for uh, spending your lunch hour with us. We appreciate it. Excellent. Ryan, I think we have a few other announcements before everyone heads out. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you for uh, staying on just a little bit longer. We have a few announcements. Um, next up, we're going to be discussing the a kaleidoscope of marketing, our, our annual uh, Spectrum Awards. Trevor, do you want to make a, a brief announcement here? Yep. I just uh, teased it up earlier on. But before I do that, just uh, another quick thank you to Steve and Jonathan and Taylor as well. Uh, thank you all for uh, you know another great event. And uh, if you hadn't heard, uh, Taylor is going to be our awesome MC for the upcoming Kaleidoscope of Marketing for our Spectrum Award. So we're super thrilled about that. Uh, deadline was extended. So please get your entries in by April 3rd. Uh, use that QR code on the screen or uh, reach out if you have any questions. We're excited for the event and hoping to see you there. Perfect. Thank you, Trevor. So we will be sending out this uh, the slides uh, via email after uh, this call. I believe it would be either this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, again, submit your entries now while you still can, and make sure you get your tickets to attend the fabulous Spectrum Awards. It's going to be a magical evening at uh, the Phoenix Art Museum. Really looking forward to seeing everyone there. Um, and then we have a webinar happening on April 18th. It's the Earn and Churn Marketing Productive Marketing Predictive Role in Customer Experience ROI with Lynn Hunsaker, uh, who uh, will be uh, uh, looking at uh, the uh, predictive insights for our customer experiences and the ROI from that. And then uh, we have a lot of volunteer opportunities. Uh, if you want to participate in future events, uh, engage with AMA, start building uh, or uh, increasing your scale of your network. 
Uh, we would love to have support. Uh, feel free to reach out directly or go to amaphoenix.org to learn more information there. And that is all the updates I had today. So thank you so much for everyone attending. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jonathan. Fantastic uh, webinar and really, really looking forward to uh, revisiting some of these notes <laughs> into uh, right on. Your insights. And uh, looks like we can add you on LinkedIn and to uh, reach out if we have additional questions. So we appreciate that. Awesome. All right. Well, have thanks, a great everyone. Day. Thank you thanks, all. Everyone. Have a great, have a great rest afternoon. of your day.